Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone, and thank you to everyone who wished us a Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. And Merry Christmas to anyone who wasn't here. Uh, hi, Dan. Hi, Ren. Sin Shan, hello. How is everyone today? Kind of a very chill day. Mm -hmm. We're doing kind of a chapter out of left field. I wasn't so sure about doing, but honestly, it is kind of an interesting chapter once you break it down. So, uh, last time we streamed, we said put your suggestions in the comments. Um, and we know we've had a lot of comments and chats saying, do the Felix Felices chapter where... Harry goes to Hagrid's and blah, blah, blah. And we said we would definitely do that chapter. Uh, but we did have someone who commented and said, do chapter seven of Order of the Phoenix. So we decided to do chapter seven of Order of the Phoenix today. So to you who requested chapter seven, we're going to do it today. Um, and before we get all situated i'll just grab the book and get it in front of me oh oh, 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 oh. it's such a big boy it is such a big boy oh. <coughs> oh and dan the snow actually just missed us we got a ton of wind a little bit of snow but for the most part it missed us yeah so we we didn't get all of the, like, lake effect, heavy, heavy snow. Um, although I did read that there were 28 dead in Buffalo. Buffalo got hammered. Buffalo got really hammered. Buffalo, Rochester, all those big cities over there, like, they got swamped. Um, but we're not close enough to the Great Lakes that we get tons and tons of snow. But we did get a lot of that wind and I had to work on the day that the storm hit. And let me tell you, we didn't get a lot of snow, but it was freaking cold, son. And the wind was terrible trying to take care of the animals. Okay. This is cold. It's like first world problems. Someone from Buffalo watching right now. Have you seen <laughs> Buffalo? I know. I know. I know. I know. Okay. <laughs> they they did get slammed and to it's anyone like that storm we had in 2015 to anyone who had to go to the buffalo zoo that day i am very sorry <laughs> because someone had to go to the buffalo zoo to feed those animals and i am very sorry for them i will say that the animals are fine the animals are good. They all got fed. They're all inside. They're all warm. Like, the animals are fine. We made sure that all the animals were okay. Like, it, it sucked, but all the animals are okay. <laughs> you guys need to read some of the Lord Voldemort chapters, like the ones in the Half-Blood Prince. Oh, Ryan, don't worry. We can revisit any of those if you want because some of those are my favorite chapters of all time okay so all y'all need to do is put that shit in the comments and say yo read them horcrux chapters and i will read the shit out of those because all those horcrux chapters are some of my favorites anything with lord voldemort i am so down for like it's oh, not even funny. It's not even funny. Like, ah, oh, kept Can't stand them. Just kill them. No, kill them, no, oh, no, no. Like, Hepzibah Smith and Voldemort asking to be defense against the dark arts professor. Like, ah, oh, that stuff is so good. Oh, it's so good. Is there a fanfic where they write Voldemort as like goal oriented and lays off all the monologuing? It's just like, he's, oh, I have Harry Potter here. Well, Avada Kedavra. All right, he, let's move on, people. But he's 
Voldemort is goal oriented. He is. I'm sorry, everyone. I I am not a hundred percent sober today. Just FYI, I am not sober. I'm a little tipsy. Just throwing it out there. Um, well, let's not get in Voldemort. But it would be interesting to read some fan fiction to see what would happen if Voldemort like just didn't monologue and he just took care of business. He can't help and himself. Killed Harry though. when he had the chance. That's outside of his character, though. I know, but it'd be interesting to see what would have happened to the world. We should do Harry two was... Voldemort chapters in one stream. It's that good. I agree with you. Listen, Ryan, let me just, let me just for a second. One of the reasons why the Half-Blood Prince movie is so bad is because they don't include the other memories of Voldemort. Like, those memories in that book are so, so good. Like, ah, they're so, so good. And they're some of my favorite moments in the entire series. Hepzibah Smith, the House of Gaunt, like, all that stuff is so, so good. And uh, honestly, some of those are my favorite chapters in the entire series. Like, Half-Blood Prince is honestly a contender for favorite book in the series just for those chapters and the evolution of Voldemort as a character and how you really get to see the development of, of Voldemort through these like little memory capsules like ah so good so so good so I'm feeling you on that I'm feeling you on reading some Horcrux memory shit. I am down for that. But it's about what everyone else requests. So you gotta comment. You and gotta put your input out there and say, yo, read this shit. And then we will read that shit. We'll probably get to everything at some point. But like Dan also said, uh, after we read this, we kind of have to read the hearing. Because I thought the hearing was in this chapter. The hearing is not in this chapter. All right, so... <clears throat> <clears throat> the reason we chose this chapter is I went through the comments um, and we did have quite a few people just say things like Merry Christmas and Happy New Year, which thank you very much to everyone. Merry Christmas to you. Happy holidays to whatever you celebrate and Happy New Year. Um, but we had one person request this chapter and no one else requested anything else. Um, and I know we have a lot of people who have said that they want the Felix Felicis chapter, um, where, uh, Harry actually takes Felix. Uh, so that's, the chapter is actually called The Burial. Um, we've had a lot of people request that chapter, and I know we're going to read that chapter, but to the one individual who requested chapter seven of Order of the Phoenix... We decided to honor that request because we're kind of in a, it's, it's not New Year's, it's almost New Year's, it's kind of like a weird time, so <coughs> we figured why not. Hello, Sarah. Hey, Sarah. Um, so we're going to do chapter seven of Order of the Phoenix called The Ministry of Magic. And it is not the hearing. The hearing is the next chapter. So this is just everything that leads up to the hearing. This is pretty much everything from Harry leaving the borough to getting to the courtroom, like, right before the hearing. But we do get to get our first glimpse of the ministry and see some of the biases that they have. Can you do, can't you do the Felix chapter together with the chapter that follows, which is a Voldemort chapter, right? Oh, yeah. Because Harry comes back and they, they immediately like, oh, but there's so much Ryan. It would be like a five hour live stream. I mean, that's fine. So... We just have to plan for it. 
I'm down to do it. I feel like we've done five hours. But there is just so much to talk about. I'm down to do it. There is just a lot there. Hey, Anna. Hello, Anna. We are doing well. We are doing well. Um, Work is stressful for me, too. So I feel you. I get it. Work is very stressful for me right now. So I understand. Yep. We just had our end of the year accounting rush and everything so it's been crazy it's stressful for me because it's been fucking cold and everything is frozen and animals cannot be outside in the freezing cold and it's it's, it's, ah, it's been it's been very difficult because we have african animals and i take care of african animals and it's fucking cold for african animals so I feel you, girl. I feel you. This is stressful. <laughs> but that's why we're here. Forget that, about all that stress. Relax. We're here for Harry Potter. And dive into the magical world oh, of Harry Potter. I'm, I'm reading the illustrated edition, which is quite wieldy. It's very large. It is very fat. But we're going to read it because I would rather read out of this. Um... Then my house edition, because the pages are more forgiving of sticky notes. Also, just disclaimer again, I am not sober, so bear that in mind as I read uh, through this. Hopefully it still sounds good. Are we ready, everyone? for this this chapter and as always bigs if you think of anything chime in oh i will let you know lola are you ready are you ready to do are you ready to do are you ready to do i think doda is ready she's good to go all right, Doda. Chapter 7. The Ministry of Magic. Harry awoke at half past five the next morning as abruptly and completely as if somebody had yelled in his ear. For a few moments he lay immobile as the prospect of disciplinary hearing filled every tiny particle of his brain. Then, unable to bear it, he leapt out of bed and put on his glasses. Mrs. Weasley had laid out his freshly laundered jeans and T-shirt at the foot of his bed. Harry scrambled into them. The blank picture on the wall sniggered. Was that Phineas Nigellus laughing at him? Most likely. Ron was lying sprawled on his, <clears throat> sprawled on his back with his mouth wide open, fast asleep. He did not stir as Harry crossed the room, stepped out onto the landing and closed the door softly behind him. Try not to think of the la- Ew. Try not to think of the next time he would see Ron, when they might not- when they might no longer be fellow students at Hogwarts. Harry walked quickly- Harry walked quietly down the stairs, past the heads of Creature's ancestors, and down into the kitchen. All right, I'm just going to say- What what are you doing? Ripping off the thing. I'm sorry. So, Harry says, trying not to think of the next time he would see Ron when they might not lo- <clears throat> when they might no longer be fellow students at Hogwarts. Oh my god, sorry. Um, that's foreshadowing. Wait, for what? When so, they, they leave and they're... They're not going to be students at Hogwarts for the entire seventh year. Yeah. And when would be the next time he would see Ron? Kind of also, like, foreshadows, like, Ron's going to, like, defect and leave. So it's like a double thing right there. Oh, okay. There's a little foreshadowing right there. Like, when they might not... Might not be students at Hogwarts anymore and when would he see Ron and blah 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 but that all comes full circle in seven when they don't go back to Hogwarts and Ron inevitably like leaves because 
you know, he has issues. Uh, yeah. Horcrux issues. Horcrux issues. Horcrux issues happen. It's tough. It's tough. He had expected it to be empty, but when he reached the door, he heard the soft rumble of voices on the other side. He pushed it open and saw Mr. and Mrs. Weasley, Sirius Lupin and Tonks sitting there almost as though they were waiting for him. All were fully dressed except Mrs. Weasley, who was wearing a quilted purple dressing gown. She leapt to her feet the moment Harry entered. Must be nice not to have a fucking job. Just wear your jammies all day and make food for everyone. All right, Mrs. Weasley. I mean... Stay-at-home parent is a full-time job. It, Are you uh, kidding? Yeah. I would much rather have a job than be a stay-at-home parent. Just saying. It's fucking it's tough. It's fucking tough. <clears throat> much respect to any stay-at-home moms or dads. Yeah, yeah, that shit's hard. Breakfast! She said as she pulled out her wand and hurried over to the fire. Ma, ma, morning, Harry. Yawned Tonks. Her hair was blonde and curly this morning. Sleep all right? Yeah, said Harry. I've be, 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 been up all night, she said with another shuddering yawn. Come and sit down. She drew out a chair, knocking over the one beside it in the process. What do you want, Harry? Mrs Weasley called. Porridge? Muffins? Kippers? Bacon and eggs? Toast? Just toast, thanks, said Harry. Lupin glanced at Harry, then said to Tonks, What were you saying about Scrimgeour? Oh, yeah. Well, we need to be a bit more careful. He's been asking Kingsley and me funny questions. Harry felt vaguely grateful that he was not required to join the conversation. His insides were squirming. Mrs Weasley placed a couple of pieces of toast and marmalade in front of him. He tried to eat, but it was like chewing carpet. Mrs. Weasley sat down on his other side and started fussing with his T-shirt, tucking in the label and smoothing out the creases across his shoulders. He wished she wouldn't. And I'll have to tell Dumbledore I can't do night duty tomorrow. I'm just too, too, too tired. Tonks finished, yawning hugely again. <clears throat> I'll cover for you, said Mr. Weasley. I'm OK. I've got a report to finish anyway. Mr. Weasley was not wearing wizard's robes, but a pair of pinstripe trousers and an old bomber jacket. He returned from he turned from Tonks to Harry. How are you feeling? Harry shrugged. It'll all be over soon, Mr. Weasley said bracingly. In a few hours' time, you'll be cleared. Harry said nothing. The hearing's on my floor, in Amelia Bones's office. She's head of the Department of Magical Law Enforcement. And the one who'll be questioning you. Amelia Bones is okay, Harry, said Tonks earnestly. She's fair. She'll hear you out. Harry nodded, still unable to think of anything to say. Don't lose your temper, said Sirius abruptly. Be polite and stick to the facts. Harry nodded again. The law's on your side, said Lupin quietly. Even underage wizards are allowed to use magic in life-threatening situations. Something very cold trickled down the neck. <clears throat> trickled down the back of Harry's neck. For a moment, he thought someone was putting a disillusionment charm on him. Then he realized Mrs. Weasley was to, was attacking his hair with a comb. She pressed hard on the top of his head. "Doesn't it ever lie flat?" she said desperately. Harry shook his head. Mr. Weasley checked his watch and looked up at Harry. I think we'll go now, he said. We're a bit early, but I think you'll be better off at the ministry than hanging round, round, hanging round here. OK, said Harry automatically, dropping his toast and getting to his feet. You'll be all right, Harry, said Tonks, patting him on the arm. Good luck, said Lupin. I'm sure it'll be fine. And if it's not, said Sirius grimly, I'll see you to Amelia Bones for you. Harry smiled weakly. Mrs Weasley hugged him. We've got all our fingers crossed, she said. Right, said Harry. Well, see you later then. He followed Mr Weasley upstairs and along the hall. 
He could hear Sirius's mother grunting in her sleep behind her curtains. Mr Weasley unbolted the door and they stepped out into the cold grey dawn. You don't normally walk to work, do you? Harry asked him as they set off briskly round the square. No, I'll usually apparate, said Mr Weasley. But obviously you can't and I think it's best we arrive in a thoroughly non-magical fashion. Makes a better impression, given what you're being disciplined for. Wait, why couldn't he just apparate him and Harry? He could. That's the point of the conversation. No. Oh. But he feels like it would make a better impression if they arrived on foot. Mm. Okay, I guess. Because Harry's accused of using magic, and if they did sight along apparition, you could say some shit. Oh, Harry did the apparating. It wasn't Mr. Weasley. Right, right, right. That's why they're like taking the extra precaution of just walking. Yeah, fair enough. Because the ministry be dicks like that. Yeah, they are. This is when we first learn just how big of dicks they are right this is the big book where you're like oh the ministry of magic they suck and harry goes to work for them for a while then he becomes a stay-at-home dad that's true mr weasley kept his hand inside his jacket as they walked harry knew it was clenched round his wand the run-down streets were almost deserted, but when they arrived at the miserable little underground station they found it already full of early morning commuters. As ever, when he found himself in close proximity to muggles going about their daily business, Mr Weasley was hard to put to contain was hard put to contain his enthusiasm. Simply fabulous, he whispered, indicating the automatic ticket machines. Wonderfully ingenious. They're out of order said Harry, pointing at the sign. Yes, but even so, said Mr. Weasley, beaming at them fondly. I can't help but think, <sighs> is Mr. Weasley, like, really that genuinely curious, or is it more like a, a parent with a kid, you know? You know, your kid brings home this uh, macaroni painting of the Mona Lisa that just looks like they fell with a bottle of glue and their lunch onto this paper and whatever stuck stuck. I, I think it's like, oh, it's lovely. That's that's great. Good job. You are something. I think that's Next Van Gogh. I think that's part of it, but I think he is a little more respectful of muggles. Like maybe, or is it just But at the how, same time how do, how do these simple people come up with these ingenious things? That is definitely these. the attitude. And then Harry is like, yeah, they're not working right now. <laughs> Arthur is just like, look at them go. They made this thing. Look at them. And Harry's like, yeah, it's not working right now. Even still, good for them. It's, I guess it's like uh... at least Arthur is trying to be like appreciative even though right? there is the, a the condescending more, the more element I hear it, yeah there's just i'm like how much of it is appreciative and just what's condescending in there there's gotta be a little bit there's some condescension but at the same time like arthur's greatest ambition is to understand what makes airplanes stand up and he doesn't understand and it. the function of a rubber duck it, well that's a movie thing oh is it it's a movie thing oh, okay. yeah but that is the thing, like, when he does his whole, um, uh, security question with Molly, he's like, what is my greatest ambition? And she's just like, to find out how airplanes stay up. So, like, he is generally in awe of muggles, like, how do airplanes work? How do they do it without magic? But then at the same time, he's like, oh, bless them. They've done this. This is great. <laughs> that, like, Arthur that bless is... Bless your heart. Yeah. Arthur very much kind of, I think, straddles the two ideologies between, like, being generally Maybe that's impressed. Why he's so great. 
<laughs> but then sometimes condescending about it, like, oh, bless them, they figured this out. And then in the mix of all that hair... learned to fly. Good job, champ. But at the same time, he's like, how did they do it? Oh, yeah. How did they do it? And then in the middle of that, you've got Harry, who's like, yeah, this isn't working right now. <laughs> so, you just... think that's impressive. Wait until they can actually do something. <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, it is really weird that they don't have magical lawyers so that maybe it's just this particular case. I think it's, I, think I feel it's like it's this case. case. I feel like it's this particular case where it's just like a hearing thing where you don't need a, a lawyer, but I feel like Harry kind of gets one with Dumbledore. He does, but I feel like with, of age wizards and like other things, there must be like wizard solicitors that's what they call lawyers they call them solicitors oh okay um i i feel like it's just this very specific situation that harry doesn't have representation but i am sure there are other scenarios where um they must have some kind of representation if you're like a legal adult you could probably hire maybe they're not lawyers per se but like some kind of legal representative to represent you in court just thinking of like wizard um Saul Goodman I knew you were gonna say that. I knew you were gonna say that. <laughs> oh hey Angela happy holidays we are doing fantastic. Yes, Hope we are doing fantastic. your holidays fa- were great. Uh, uh, should I keep going? Oh, uh, yeah. They bought their tickets instead of... <clears throat> they bought their tickets instead from a sleeping, sleepy-looking guard. Harry handled the transaction as Mr. Weasley was not very good with muggle money. And five minutes later, they were boarding an underground train that rattled them off toward the centre of London. Mr. Weasley kept anxiously checking and rechecking the underground map above the windows. Four more stops, Harry. Three stops left now. Two stops to go, Harry. They got off at a station in the very heart of London and were swept from the train in a tide of besuited men and women carrying briefcases. Up the escalator they went, through the ticket barrier. Mr. Weasley, delighted with the way the style swallowed his ticket, and emerged onto a broad street lined with imposing-looking buildings and already full of traffic. "'Where are we?' said Mr Weasley blankly, and for one heart-stopping moment Harry thought they'd got off at the wrong station, despite Mr Weasley's continual references to the map. But a second later he said, "'Ah, yes, this way, Harry,' and led him down a side road. "'Sorry,' he said, "'but I've never come by train, and it all looks rather different from a muggle perspective.' As a matter of fact, I've never even used the visitor's entrance before. The further they walked, the smaller and less imposing the buildings became, until finally they reached a street that contained several rather shabby-looking offices, a pub and an overflowing skip. Harry had expected a rather impressive location for the Ministry of Magic. "'Here we are,' said Mr Weasley brightly, pointing at an old red telephone box, which was missing several panes of glass and stood before a heavily graffitied wall. After you, Harry. He opened the telephone box door. Just saying. Arthur is the head of the Misuse of Muggle Artifacts Division. He and Harry have handled muggle money before. Can he not count? How difficult is it to handle muggle money? Can he not see the numbers on the notes? Well, the notes would be fine, but I feel like it gets complicated when you get into change. The numbers are on them, though! 50p! 10, 10 quid! Yeah. Like, yeah, they do have that on it, don't like, they? It, the I'm numbers are like, on them. Uh, U.S. money, you know. The dime doesn't have... Well, no, the the U.S. money doesn't have it on there. I don't know enough about um, 
uh, the UK's currency. He looks at the the notes and he's like, "What's happening? They're, the numbers are on them, Arthur." Well, no, I agree. Like, you know, someone asked for twenty dollars and you have four or five. He couldn't do it. He, Dan is right. Like, during the Quidditch World Cup, he needed to hand the dude notes, like, paper money. And he couldn't do it. He did, He couldn't read the number. I'm like, Arthur, you are the misuse of muggle artifacts. You are fascinated is... by muggles. You are into everything about muggles. And you and can't do doing... the money? And he is doing a fantastic, a fantastic job. He is misusing all the muggle artifacts. Oh my god, Arthur! Like, come on, dude! Learn to use muggle money, if nothing else. Oh! Harry stepped inside, wondering what on earth this was about. Mr. Weasley folded himself in beside Harry and closed the door. It was a tight fit. Harry was jammed against the telephone apparatus, which was hanging crookedly from the wall, as though a vandal had tried to rip it off. Mr. Weasley reached past Harry for the receiver. Mr. Weasley, I think this might be out of order too, Harry said. No, no, I'm sure it's fine, said Mr. Weasley, holding the receiver above his head and peering at the dial. Let's see. Six, he dialed the number. Two, four, and another four... And another two. Which, incidentally, if you check those numbers on your little phone back in the day, uh, six, two, four, and four, and two spells magic. Back in the day, I mean, your phone still has it. Yeah, but... At least mine does. It still shows them when I bring up the dial pad. But yeah, that's pretty interesting. It's It literally spells magic. If you look up those numbers on like a traditional phone dial pad, it spells magic. As the dial word, word, word smoothly back into place, a cool female voice signed it, sounded inside the telephone box, not from the receiver in Mr. Weasley's hand, but as loudly and plainly as though an invisible woman was standing right beside them. Welcome to the Ministry of Magic. Please state your name and business. Er, uh, said Mr. Weasley, clearly uncertain whether or not he should talk into the receiver. He compromised by holding the mouthpiece to his ear. Arthur Weasley, misuse of Muggle Artifacts Office, here to escort Harry Potter, who has been asked to attend a disciplinary hearing. Thank you, said the cool female voice. Visitor, please take the badge and attach it to the front of your robes. There was a click and a rattle, and Harry saw something slide out of the metal chute where returned coins usually appeared. He picked it up. It was a square silver badge with Harry Potter disciplinary hearing on it. He pinned it to the front of his t-shirt as the female voice spoke again. Visitor to the Ministry, you are required to submit submit to a search and present your wand for registration at the security desk, which is located at the far end of the atrium. The floor of the telephone box shuddered. They were sinking slowly into the ground. Harry watched apprehensively as the pavement seemed to rise up past the glass windows to the telephone box until darkness closed over their heads. Then he could see nothing at all. He could only hear a dull grinding noise as the telephone box made its way down through the earth. After about a minute, though it felt much longer to Harry, a chink of golden light illuminated his feet and, widening, rose up his body until it hit him in the face and he had to blink to stop his eyes watering. The Ministry of Magic wishes you a pleasant day, said the woman's voice. The door of the telephone box sprang open and Mr Weasley stepped out of it, followed by Harry, whose mouth had fallen open. They were standing at the far end of a very long and splendid hall with a highly polished dark wood floor. The peacock blue ceiling was inlaid with gleaming golden symbols that kept moving and changing like some enormous heavenly notice board. 
The walls on each side were panelled in shiny dark wood and had many gilded fireplace set into them. Every few seconds a witch or wizard would emerge from one of the left-hand fireplaces with a soft whoosh. On the right-hand side, short queues were forming before each fireplace, waiting to depart. Halfway down the hall was a fountain. A group of golden statues, larger than life-size, stood in the middle of a circular pool. Tallest of them was a noble-looking wizard with his wand pointed straight up in the air. Grouped round him were a beautiful witch, a centaur, a goblin and a house-elf. The last three were all gazing adorn <coughs> looking adoringly up at the witch and wizard. Glittering jets of water were flying from the ends of their wands. The point of the centaur's arrow, the tips of the goblin's hat and each of the house elves ears so that the tinkling hiss of falling water was added to the pops and cracks of the apparatus and the clatter of footsteps as hundreds of witch and witches and wizards, most of whom were wearing glum early morning looks, strode towards a set of golden gates at the far end of the hall. You know, just envisioning this, I smelt a mall. You know that mall smell? Yeah. I also... also I also can't help but picture how funny it would be to have a Doctor Who Harry Potter crossover. Arthur walks into the wrong phone box one day. I mean, I'm sure I'm sure it's been written somewhere. I'm sure someone has said something about it at some point. There's um, a lot of fun you could have with that. That would be great. This statue is at once foreshadowing given what will happen with the statue later. And I feel like the flu powder thing is also like a sense of foreshadowing because uh, the ministry will monitor the flu powder network and they will catch Sirius in the flu powder network and Umbridge will like almost get him. Um, yeah, but like... They're... There's a lot I want to say. I'm going to wait till the end of the chapter, though, because okay. I feel like we need the full picture. Okay. I um, wonder if any of the people in cloaks visited the bakery that Vernon stopped in at, at the beginning of our story. Probably. <laughs> that would have been, like, a cool little Easter egg if she just mentioned, like, Harry walking by, like, a wizard in a cloak eating a croissant or... Or a, a, a bun, the same bun yeah. that Vernon had. This way, said Mr. Weasley. They joined the throng, wending their way between the ministry workers, some of whom were carrying tottering piles of parchment, others battered briefcases, still others were reading the Daily Prophet while they walked. As they passed the fountain, Harry saw silver sickles and bron <clears throat> bronze canuts waving, glinting up at him from the bottom of the pool. A small smudged sign beside it read, All proceeds from the Fountain of Magical Brethren will be given to St. Mungo's Hospital for magical maladies and injuries. More foreshadowing that we will go there later in this book. Ah! Right, this chapter is kind of like a cornerstone of the story. If All I'm not foreshadowing. If I'm not expelled from Hogwarts, I'll put in ten galleons, Harry found himself thinking desperately. Over here, Harry, said Mr. Weasley, and they stepped out of the stream of ministry employees heading for the Golden Gates. Seated at a desk to the left, beneath a sign saying security, a badly shaven wizard in peacock blue robes looked up as they approached and put down his daily profit. I'm escorting a visitor, said Mr. Weasley, gesturing towards Harry. Step over here, said the wizard in a bored voice. Harry walked closer to him, and the wizard held up a long golden rod, thin and flexible as a car aerial, and passed it up and down Harry's front and back. Wand, grunted the security wizard at Harry, putting down the golden instrument and holding out his hand. Harry produced his wand. The wizard dropped it onto a strange brass instrument, which looked something, which looked something like a large, which looked something like a set of scales with only one dish. It began to vibrate. A narrow strip of parchment came speeding out of a slit in the base. The wizard tore this off and read the writing on it. Eleven inches, phoenix feather core, been in use for four years. That's correct? Yes, 
said Harry nervously. I'll keep this, said the wizard, impaling the slip of parchment on a small brass spike. You get this back, he added, thrusting the wand at Harry. Thank you. Hang on, said the wizard slowly. His eyes had darted from the silver visitor's badge on Harry's chest to his forehead. Thank you, Eric, said Mr Weasley firmly, and grasping Harry by the shoulder, he steered him away from the desk and bask... <coughs> and back into the stream of wizards and witches walking through the golden gates. Jostled slightly by the crowd, Harry followed Mr Weasley through the gates into the smaller hall beyond, where at least twenty lifts stood with behind behind wrought golden grills. Harry and Mr Weasley joined the crowd round one of them. Nearby stood a big bearded wizard holding a large cardboard box which was emitting rasping noises. All right, Arthur, said the wizard, nodding at Mr Weasley. What have you got there, Bob? asked Mr Weasley, looking at the box. We're not sure, said the wizard seriously. We thought it was a bog-standard chicken until it started breathing fire. Looks like a serious breach of the ban on experimental breeding to me. With a great jangling and clattering, a lift descended in front of them. The golden grill slid back, and Harry and Mr Weasley stepped into the lift with the rest of the crowd, and Harry found himself jammed against the back wall. Several witches and wizards were looking at him curiously. He stared at his feet to avoid catching anyone's eye, flattening his fringe as he did so. The grill slid shut with a crash, and the lift ascended slowly, chains rattling, while the same cool female voice Harry had heard in the telephone box rang out again. Level 7. Department of Magical Games and Sports. Incorporating the British and Irish Quidditch League headquarters, official Gobstones Club, and ludicrous patents office. The lift doors opened. Harry glimpsed an untidy-looking corridor, with various posters of Quidditch teams packed lopsidedly on the walls. One of the wizards in the lift, who was carrying an arm full of broomsticks, extricated himself with difficulty and disappeared down the corridor. The doors closed, the lift juddered upwards, and the woman's voice announced, Level 6. Department of Magical Transportation, incorporating the Flu Network Authority, Broom Regul... Broom Regulation Control, Port Key Office, and Apparition Test Centre. Apparition Test Centre! Foreshadowing for next book! Wait, how did the Apparition Test Centre foreshadow next book? Just that they learn Apparition? Yeah, yeah. The, oh, the, okay. That uh, Ron is, like, ready to learn and blah, blah, blah. But they're not actually going to go there because they're not going to be back in seventh year. Nope. But in this book, you like, oh, this is where you learn to, this is where you go to do your official test. And then in book six, you're like, oh, they're going to do it. They're going to do it. But then they don't come back. They do it themselves. That's right. But Dan, Ron, not so well, but that's okay. Dan, I was thinking the whole, the same thing. Gobstones get their whole government department. Gobstones? Well, like here we have quidditch and by the way gobstones yeah but harry's or harry snape's mom makes it into the daily prophet for being like the president of the gobstones team that's i'm gonna have to look up what gobstones are i feel i think i looked it up at one point they've got to be pretty they got to be pretty legit i mean i could get wizard's chest just because chess is such a big Chess is thing, all, well. Even let's for just us establish. Muggles. Let's just establish that chess is a big thing because chess is awesome. Well, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I don't know anything about gobstones. They do get tested in Hogsmeade, right? That's true. They do get tested in Hogsmeade. Ron fails because he left behind half an eyebrow. But like the apparition testing center, it just is like, it gets you jogging your brain about it. Oh, okay. See, maybe that's why I was confused about it, because I, I thought they tested, too, in Hogsmeade. They do. So there, that's, that's kind of why I was like, what are you talking about at first? I just like that they mention it here, because I feel like apparition. Hey, Tom. Wizard's chest like is violent. 
it is kind of like marbles. Yeah. Um, Chosen's right. It's, um, Gobstones kind of has that like marbles entity to it. To is it like marbles, but they explode or something. I'm not sure. I don't know enough about it. Or no, that the that's exploding, that exploding snap. snap. Yeah. That must be. Once again, the lift doors opened, and four or five witches and wizards got out. At the same time, several paper airplanes swooped into the lift. Harry stared up at them as they flapped idly above his head. They were a pale violet colour, and he could see Ministry of Magic stamped along the edge of their wings. Just into departmental memos, Mr Weasley muttered to him. We used to use owls, but the mess was unbelievable. Droppings all over the desks. As they clattered upwards again, the memos flapped round the lamp swaying from the lift ceiling. Level 5, Department of International Mag Magical Cooperation, incorporating the International Magical Trading Standards Body, the International Magical Office of Law, and the International Confederation of Wizards, British, seat, British seats. When the doors opened, two of the memos zoomed out with a few more of the witches and wizards, but several more memos zoomed in so that the light from the lamp flickered and flashed overhead as they darted round it. Level 4. Department for the Regulation and Control of Magical Creatures, Incorporating Beast, Being and Spirit Divisions, Goblin Liaison Office and Pest Advisory Bureau. Skews said the wizard carrying the fire-breathing chicken, and he left the lift pursued by a flock of memos. The doors clanged shut yet again. Level 3. Department of Magical Accidents and Catastrophes, including the Accidental Magic Reversal Squad, Obliviator Headquarters, and Muggle-Worthy Excuse Committee. I had to tag this because what the fuck is the magic, the muggle worthy excuse committee? The muggle worthy excuse That is committee. what it says. Muggle worthy excuse committee. What the fuck is that? And what do they do? Muggle worthy excuse. Uh, maybe. I got some questions. Maybe if you perform magic <laughs> in front of a muggle, it's where they would send you like. Maybe had Harry not been that's underage, okay. that's where he would have gone. Muggle worthy excuse commit. They're a committee, though. What like they're a committee, so they're meeting to like. What is this? Wizards got some weird committees and government offices, I guess. Oh, Tom, I am always down to get off topic to talk about The Witcher. Um, and no, I have not started watching it yet. We're, uh, I'm trying to finish up Better Call Saul before we start it. And I was going to just hop in, but then I saw, like, the ratings for it, and it's pretty bad. I don't know if it's just being review bombed, but... Oh, what, season three uh, being bombed? No, uh, Blood Origin. Oh, Oh, the, the spinoff. I'm just muggle worthy excuse committee. What's happening here? I am going to watch it at some point. I just, after I saw those reviews, I'm not super excited mm -hmm. to jump right in. <laughs> Ideas to confuse muggles who witness magic. They brainstorm ideas. Maybe, yeah. Honestly, that 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 actually maybe, makes the most sense. Maybe. Like, they have uh, you know Muggle experts come in and say, "Well, you know, this spell kind of looks like this, so we could say." But Mister Weasley is a supposed Muggle expert. Well, no, he is an expert in Muggle artifacts, not the Muggles. He just comes in when. There's been some work with, like, muggle items. But then there are people who specialize in coming up with, like, the excuses. They're the men in black dudes that come in and, you know, scan you. Well, it does say Obliviator Headquarters. Yeah. And Muggle Excuse Place. All right. So maybe they're just like, you're going to Obliviate and then give them some kind of story that's believable. 
Yeah, that's right. Maybe that's what it is. You didn't see anything. You were abducted by aliens and probed. Now go back to sleep. Everybody left the lift on this floor except Mr. Weasley, Harry, and a witch who was reading an extremely long piece of parchment that was trailing on the floor. The remaining memos continued to soar round the lamp as the lift juddered upwards again. Then the doors opened and the voice made its announcement. Level 2. Department of Magical Law Enforcement, including the Improper Use of Magic Office, Aura Headquarters, and Wizengamot Administration Services. This is us, Harry said Mr. Weasley, and they followed the witch out of the lift into a corridor lined with doors. My office is on the other side of the... on the... on the other side of the floor. Mr. Weasley, said Harry, as they passed a window through which sunlight was streaming. Aren't we still underground? Yes, we are, said Mr. Weasley. Those are enchanted windows. Magical maintenance decide what weather we'll get every day. We had two months of hurricanes last time they were angling for a pay raise. Just round here, Harry. They turned a corner, walked through a pair of heavy oak doors, and emerged in a cluttered open area divided into cubicles, which was buzzing with talk and laughter. Memos were zooming in and out of cubicles like miniature rockets. A lopsided sign on the nearest cubicle read, Aura Headquarters. Harry looked surreptuously around the doorways as they passed, the Auras had covered their cubicle walls with everything from pictures of wanted wizards and photographs of their families to posters of their favourite Quidditch teams and articles from the Daily Prophet. A scarlet-robed man with a ponytail longer than Bill's was sitting with his boots up on his desk, dictating a report to his quill. A little further along, a witch with an eye patch over one eye was talking over the top of her cubicle wall to Kingsley Shacklebolt. "'Morning, Weasley.' said Kingley carelessly as they drew nearer. I've been wanting a word with you when you have a second. Yeah, if it really is a second, said Mr Weasley, I'm in rather a hurry. They were talking as though they hardly knew each other, and when Harry opened his mouth to say hello to Kingsley, Mr Weasley stood on his foot. They followed Kingsley along the row and into the very last cubicle. Harry received a slight shock. Blinking down at him from every direction was Sirius's face. Newspaper cuttings and old photographs, even the one of Sirius being best man at the Potter's wedding, papered the walls. The only Sirius free space was a map of the wall in which little red, <coughs> little red pins were glowing like jewels. Here, said Kingsley brusquely to Mr Weasley, shoving a sheaf of parchment into his hand. I need as much information as possible on flying muggle vehicles sighted in the last twelve months. We've received information that Black might be still using his old motorcycle. I just wrote a sticky that said... <laughs> yeah, but don't they know that Hagrid has it? Like, hasn't Hagrid had the yeah, bike? Yeah, but why would, the, why would... The ministry now. I didn't know it would be like a secret. Like, why did it matter, you know? I mean, obviously they didn't, but I. I yeah, I don't know. Oh, okay. Gobstones use special stones that squirt a foul smelling liquid any time a player loses a point. Ah. Uh, that yeah. sounds awful. That sounds like the Mimbulus Mimbletonia. Yeah. I wonder if that's the stuff that they put inside the gobstones that squirts out. Ew. Ew. <laughs> Makes sense though. Kingsley tipped Harry on a, a Kingsley tipped Harry an enormous wink and added in a whisper, "Give him the magazine. He might find it interesting." Then he said in normal tones, "And don't take too long, Weasley." The delay on that fire legs report held our investigation up for a month. If you read my report, you would know the term is firearms, said Mr. Weasley coolly. And I'm afraid you'll have to wait for information on motorcycles. We're extremely busy at the moment. He dropped his voice and said, If you can get away before seven, Molly's making meatballs. Who the hell is not going to hear that shit? 
The way to be subtle, he, Arthur. He like, whispered. He whispered, but it's, it's a very tiny... No one can hear a whisper. Yeah, it's fine. Oh, yeah, it's fine. yeah okay. <clears throat> he beckoned to Harry and led him out of Kingsley's cubicle through a second set of oak doors into another passage, turned left, marched along another corridor, turned right into a dimly lit and distinctly shabby corridor and finally reached a dead end where a door to the left stood ajar, revealing a broom cupboard and a door on the right that bore a tarnished brass plaque reading Misuse of Muggle Artifacts. Mr. Weas Mr. Weasley's dingy office seemed to be slightly smaller than the broom cupboard. Two desks had been crammed inside and there was barely enough space to move around them because of all the overflowing filing cabinets lining the walls on top of which were tottering piles of files. The little wall space available bore witness to Mr Weasley's obsessions. Several posters of cars, including one of a dismantled engine, two illustrations of post boxes he seemed to have cut out of muggle children's books, and a diagram showing how to wire a plug. Sitting on top of Mr Weasley's overflowing in tray was an old toaster that was hiccuping, hiccuping in, a dis in, a, in a disconsolate way, and a pair of empty leather gloves that were twiddling their thumbs. A photograph of the Weasley family stood beside the in tray. Harry noticed that Percy appeared to have walked out of it. Fucking rude. We haven't got a window. Wait, what? Oh, did you? Was it? Oh, you were spying to it. I thought it said. I was like, what? <laughs> Wait. <laughs> I was responding to that. PG thirteen. Their one f bomb. <laughs> Sorry. We haven't got a window, said Mr. Weasley apologetically, taking off his bomber jacket and placing it on the back of his chair. We've asked, but they don't seem to think we need one. Have a seat, Harry. Doesn't look as if Perkins is in yet. Ah, corporate right there. Like, oh, you don't need one. It's fine. It's fine. Harry squeezed himself into the chair behind Perkins's desk while Mr. Weasley rifled through the sheet of parchment Kingsley Shacklebolt had given him. Ah, he said, grinning, as he extracted a copy of a magazine entitled The Quibbler from its mist. Yeah, he flicked through it. Yeah, he's right. I'm sure Sirius will find this very amusing. Oh dear, what's this now? The Quibbler. The Quibbler. Makes its first appearance. Little Luna foreshadowing there. Some stubby Boardman action going on. I this thought we met Luna. In the last... No, we didn't, did we? This is the book where we meet Luna. That's right. Little little quibbler for... Yeah, right? Like, ah, oh, the qui When you go back and you reread this, it's like, ah, oh, the quibbler! Eee, Luna! Introducing you a little bit. Stubby Boardman is really serious black. Like, ah, oh, that's so good. Hey, Kayla. Welcome. We are doing great. A memo had just zoomed in through the open door and fluttered to rest on top of the hiccuffing toaster. Mr. Weasley unfolded it and read it aloud. Third regurgitating public toilet reported in Bethnal Green. Kindly investigate immediately. This is getting ridiculous. A regurgitating toilet? Anti-muggle pranksters, said Mr. Weasley, frowning. We had two last week, one in Wibbledon, one in Elephant and Castle. Muggles are pulling the flush, and instead of everything disappearing, well, you can imagine. The poor things keep calling in them pim pumbles, I think they're called. You know, the ones who mend pipes and things. Plumbers? Yes, exactly. But of course they're flummoxed. Only hope we can catch whoever's doing it. Will it be Auras who catch them? Oh no, this is too trivial for Auras. It'll be the ordinary magical law enforcement patrol. Ah, Harry, this is Perkins. A stooped, timid-looking old wizard with fluffy white hair had just entered the room, panting. Ah, Arthur, he said desperately without looking at Harry. Thank goodness. I didn't know what to do for the best, whether to wait here for you or not. I've just sent an owl to your home, but obviously you've missed it. An urgent message came in ten minutes ago. I'll know about the regurgitating toilet, said Mr Weasley. No, no, it's not the toilet. It's the Potter boys hearing. They've changed the time and venue. It starts at eight o'clock now and it's down in a, uh, old call room ten. Down in a, 
But they told me Merlin's beard. Mr Weasley looked at his watch, let out a yelp and leapt from his chair. Quick, Harry, we should have been there ten minutes ago. Perkins flattened himself against the filing cabinets as Mr Weasley left the office at a run, Harry close on his heels. Why have they changed the time? Harry said breathlessly as they hurtled past the aura cubicles. People poked their heads about and stared as they streaked past. Harry felt as though he'd left all his insides back at Perkins' desk. Well, I've no idea, but thank goodness we got here so early. If you'd missed it, it would have been catastrophic. Mr Weasley skidded to a halt beside the lifts and jabbed impatiently at the down button. Come on! The lift clattered into view and they hurried inside. Every time it stopped, Mr Weasley cur- <clears throat> Mr. Weasley cursed furiously and pummeled the number nine button. Those courtrooms haven't been used in years, said Mr. Weasley angrily. I can't think why they're doing this down there unless... But no. A plump witch carrying a smoking goblet entered the lift at that moment and Mr. Weasley did not elaborate. The atrium, said the cool female voice, and the golden grill slid open, showing Harry a distant glimpse of the golden statues in the fountain. The plump witch got out, and a sallow skin <coughs> and a sallow skinned wizard with a very mournful face got in. Morning, Arthur, he said in a, sup a sepul sepulchral sepulchral voice as he as the lift began to descend. Don't often see you down here. Urgent business, Bode said Mr Weasley, who was bouncing on the balls of his feet and throwing anxious looks over Harry. I do like that in this illustrated edition they give you that illustration of the entire ministry. Yeah. I, I have yet to, like, really look at it. Ah, uh, yes, said Bode, surveying, surveying Harry unblinkingly. Of course. Harry, Harry barely had a motion to spare for Bode, but his unfaltering gaze did not make him feel any more comfortable. Department of Mysteries, said the cool female voice, and left it at that. Quick, Harry, said Mr Weasley, as the lift doors rattled open, and they sped up a corridor that was quite different from those above. The walls were bare, there were no windows and no doors apart from a plain black one set at the very end of the corridor. Harry expected them to go through it, but instead, Mr. Weasley seized him by the arm and dragged him to the left, where there was an opening leading to a flight of steps. Down here, down here, panted Mr. Weasley, taking two steps at a time. The lift doesn't even come down this far. Why'd they be doing it down here, either? They reached the bottom of the steps and ran along yet another corridor, which bore a great resemblance to the one that led to Snape's dungeon at Hogwarts, with rough stone walls and torches in brackets. The doors they passed were heavy wooden ones with iron bolts and keyholes. Courtroom 10. I think we're nearly... Yes. Mr Weasley stumbled to a halt outside the grimy, dark door with an immense iron lock and slumped against the wall, clutching at a stitch in his chest. Go on, he panted, pointing his thumb at the door. Get in there. <coughs> aren't, aren't you coming with... No, no, I'm not allowed... Good luck. Harry's heart was beating a violent tattoo against his Adam's apple. He swallowed hard, turned the heavy iron door handle, and stepped inside the courtroom. Ooh, and so it begins. So, I wanted to finish the chapter, but... Harry meets Bode here, finds out he works for the Department of Mysteries... Sees the door at the end of the corridor. And then later, what is it? Bode is at St. Mungo's. Mm -hmm. He's dreaming of the corridor with the door at the end. And then Bode is strangled by a Christmas plant. Which turned out to be a devil's snare. That apparently no one at St. Mungo's could figure out what the fuck it was. That it was a devil's snare. And then it killed that dude. Because Voldemort tried to get Bode to steal the prophecy. So much foreshadowing! It's right there! Oh my god, it's like right in your face. It's kind of crazy. 
Holy mother of God. I remember I did the whole foreshadowing thing when we first read this. Now you're doing it like ten times. Well, because we've already read it. I I couldn't spoil anything before. I could be like, oh, yeah, maybe. I don't know. But now it's like right here in your face. The Quibbler, Bode, the Department of Mysteries. It's all right there. If Harry had just put two and two together and thought, oh, this corridor that I'm seeing in my dreams, it's the same one. And when the voice said, Department of Mysteries. Yeah, that's the place, Harry. You were literally right there. How do you not remember? If only Harry had a long oh, memory. Oh, because you're too busy trying to get dicked down by Cho Chang and play Quidditch. That's why you can't remember. That's why. I think he would be doing the dick downing. Maybe Unless she's maybe she's maybe now. she's like riding him. She's Either like way. dicking him yeah. down. And none of that is in the movie. Nope. <laughs> Laughing Lex might be more hilarious than Snark Lex. <laughs> I mean, <coughs> I am here to entertain. I yep. just Bode. He's right there. Bode is also in book. F like they talk about them in book four. Like. They're the, the unspeakables are there in book four at the Quidditch World Cup. And they're like, they're unspeakables. They work in the Department of Mysteries. And then we're in book five. Bode literally works in the Department of Mysteries. Harry is like, oh, that's a long corridor with a door at the end. Mr. Weasley, don't we go this way? No, we go this way. Oh, oh, but I'm going to have dreams about this place for the rest of the book and not... Not have any clue where I am. So I'm going to keep just letting myself into Voldemort's mind and be like, oh, what is this place? What is it? Bitch, you've seen it before and you were told what it is. Where's your brain? I bet if Hermione. In his defense, he's I, focusing on other things right now. I bet if it was Hermione, though, she'd be like, oh, son, that's the Department of Mysteries. First dream Hermione had, she'd be like, yo, this is what it is. Well, yeah. Hermione. Well, that's Hermione. But she, but, well, she'd be on it. Harry's just like, what is this place? I'm not going to learn occlumency because I want to see what this place is. Ooh. <laughs> making Snape very angry, making everyone else very angry, and then getting his godfather killed because he can't remember shit that happened in summer. Harry! Well, he also couldn't remember the mirror. That's the big reason why his godfather got killed. Right, but Hermione, though. <laughs> but Hermione. <laughs> it's, 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 <laughs> Nothing against Harry at all. I love Harry to pieces. I'm just, I'm just kind of going, I'm just... Just saying Harry isn't the smartest. Well, come on, dude! It was right there! You saw it! What the fuck? It was right there! Department of Mysteries. Oh, Mr. Weasley, should we go through that door? No, we're going to go this way. Oh, but what happens at Christmas? Oh, my God. Mr. Weasley is right in front of that door. <laughs> and the snake attacks him. And Harry is like, but I was the snake. It attacked Mr. Weasley in front of this place that I have never seen before. But I am very curious about what it is. You with Mr. Weasley. <laughs> Harry, use your brain. I'm telling you, the it's Horcrux, you know. No, it's got no, crazy. it's got nothing to do with the Horcrux. It has everything to do with his dick. <laughs> he just wants to play Quidditch and get laid. That's all he wants. And he's... It, he's a teenage boy. That's what I mean. It what fucked him up. What else does he want? That's what I mean. His dick fucked him up. <laughs> he was so focused on Cho Chang and winning Quidditch. It, 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 he couldn't think. And the PTSD of Cedric Dot, Like, he couldn't... He just... He was focused. I just want to be a normal dude. I want to get laid. And I want to play sports. But if you had to put two and two together, Harry... You wouldn't be fighting with Hermione at the very end where Hermione's like, let's just make sure Sirius is okay. 
why can't we just make sure that Sirius is okay before we go? And he's just like, nah, we gotta go. Yeah, but let's just make sure. Nah, we gotta go. Yeah, but Harry, Voldemort could be in your mind right now. No, that's not the case. Yeah, but you didn't learn occlumency. You, you, you. It could be Voldemort messing with you. I no, don't need no. to learn occlumency. I'm Harry freaking Potter. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> that's kind of how it goes. <laughs> it's, it's like, ah. How would you react if you were Harry? Good lord, woman. <laughs> Mind you, I am the first one to defend Harry throughout the entirety of book five. I am just being facetious, just so you all know. Harry's pulling a real Voldemort on this one. He kind of, yeah, he's he's being a Voldemort a little bit. No one remembered Snape was in the order, though, until they saw him. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Listen. I just imagine like Sirius just like insulting Snape or saying something about it. oh oh Snape you're here what well, what are you doing here I'm well, in the order since when I mean that is kind of part of what happens because Snape does tell Sirius like no stay put don't do anything and Sirius is like that greasy mofo ain't gonna tell me what to do. I'm gonna go save my godson. Well, now since you said that, I am gonna go do something. Right, right. Like the uh, Hogwarts is actually a brothel. Like that, oh, Jesus. That um, that penguin meme. I'm... That... Well, now I don't wanna. Well, I yeah, mean, Hogwarts like... is actually a brothel. No, I mean. I mean, no, Harry's not a horn dog, but Harry is very much Look, a fifteen year old boy in the sense of he's a fifteen year old boy. It's not a with, brothel, but you're locking teenagers with raging hormones up in, in a, a castle. small common room <laughs> with easy access to the other door. Well the guys can't go to the girls, but the, the gr girls can easily access the boys. Right, right. Things are gonna happen. Molly and Arthur have established this. Yeah. Multiple times. And I'm just saying, I don't think Harry is a horn dog. But what I think. He's just reacting like a normal teenage boy. I don't think Harry is a horn dog. But I think in this book, it is apparent that Harry has gone through some extremely traumatic, awful shit. And he is stuck with. A not normal destiny, but he just wants to live a normal teenage boy's life. And he wants, he's like trying to just be a normal teenage kid. Like I get the vibes in this book that he is 15 and he wants to just like go on a date with a girl and play sports and just have and a normal life. at that date miserably. Very, very bad look for Harry. Like, oh, I'm going to go meet Hermione. And for anyone who wants to suggest that chapter, we have already established we're saving that for Valentine's yeah, Day. Yeah, that, the Madam Puttyfoot's chapter is the Valentine's Day chapter. We will read it on Valentine's Day or the week of. Just, just. But anyway, like, that that's part of the struggle with book five is that he just he wants to be a normal teenage boy but he's not and he's struggling with the trauma that he faced and the things that are happening and the dreams that he's having and he's like what is this and everyone's like you need to learn occlumency but he's like oh but if i learn occlumency then i'm not gonna see the room with the door at the end of the corridor which i saw in chapter seven which i should know what it is but i don't remember but regardless of me being snarky harry is a 15 year old boy and he wants to do 15 year old boy things and it's hard um but this that's that's a, a lot of of reasons why harry is in a raven cloth yeah. Yes. He is so Gryffindor. I, I was actually listening to a podcast today where they were like, 
Hufflepuffs, raise the roof, Ravenclaws, give it a go. Gryffindors, we don't need to hear from you. You're loud enough. Right, Harry just, I came to Hogwarts to be the best. And then someone's like, what about the Slytherins? And they're like, no. the Slytherins are a proud bunch. They don't need to, they, they know. They already know they're, they're the best. They, they don't need to shout it out. I'm like, yeah, we don't. We don't need to sing it from the rooftops. We already know we're the fucking best. We don't need to scream it. We're just quietly proud. This is, Slytherin is the best. Y'all don't need to... Mm. Mm, okay. We know. Sure. We already know. We're, we're like, we're the best. No one... We don't need to sing our own praises, because we already know. And we already know crystallized pineapple is where it's fucking at. So... Mm. Imagine being the extras of the movie that are told to make out in the background of the common room. Wait, did they... Was that a thing? Were there just people making out? In the common rooms in the movies? Which which movies? Because honestly, the number of times I've watched Half-Blood Prince, I could count on one hand because I hated it so much. I hated it! <laughs> so. I mean, maybe the director didn't tell them. I hope the director didn't tell them that. That's just weird. All right, you two sit there, just make out or something. Uh, okay. Honestly, though, Dan, even with the Ravenclaws in class, like, I would be the Slytherin who would be constantly going, ooh, 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 Like, that was me. I'd be like, ooh, ooh, ooh. I would be Hermione. Like, ooh, ooh. I can recite the text to you full verbiage and all. Like, that would be me. You'd be like an outcast Slytherin. I would be an outcast Slytherin. They would, like, I would be the outcast Slytherin. Like, I got this. Let me answer the question. I would get points for my house. I would be muggle-born. Like, uh, it would be tough. I'm a Slytherin, but it would be tough. So I'd have to, like, amplify my pride even more. Because, like, yeah, mouth... Amp amplify your pride, you would start to become a Gryffindor. No. Yeah. No. You'd be saying. the sliv. No, I would not do Pansy Parkinson's homework. I would <laughs> not do Draco Malfoy's homework, and I would do. I would not do Crab and Goyle's homework. I well, all right. Take it back. I might do Malfoy's homework if he paid me enough. I was about to say they all got Malf money. Nah. I would totally. Well, do their homework. I don't know about Crab and Goyle, right but I know Malfoy got money. Malfoy got, like, old-school centuries wealth. I could get Malfoy to pay me some serious... Not just coin. A couple of galleons per no, foot. No, nah, not, not coin, but, like, artifacts worth hundreds. I, I would do Malfoy's homework. I don't know about anyone else's, but I would do Malfoy's homework, and I could I milk that. I think you overestimate the price people will pay for homework. Not... Nah... Malfoy's talented, though. Like, Malfoy's actually, like, a smart kid. It would depend on the class. Like, oh, yeah. Malfoy is actually very talented. Like, Malfoy is naturally really gifted at occlumency, whereas Harry is really shit at it. Mm -hmm. But, like, we, Malfoy has demonstrated that he's really good at occlumency, and he fixes the vanishing cabinet. So, like, Malfoy is actually smart and pretty magically gifted. Maybe Malfoy wouldn't even ask me to do his homework. You know who I need to get? I need no, to get. No, you'd be. You aren't a pure blood. He wouldn't let you touch his quill. I'd have to get to Blaze Zabini. There you go. Blaze Zabini might be the one, because his mom has had six husbands, who were very rich, and all died under mysterious circumstances. Hmm. He could he could pay me a bit of coin to do his homework. It's gotta I'm... be weird to know your mom's like killing off these old guys, dude. And like Slughorn says it to his face too. He's like, he, like Slughorn straight up says it to his face, and Blaze Zabidi is just like, eh, eh. like I paid for my broom. Eh, whatever, cool with it. Eh, whatever. I got nice dress robes. I don't look like Ron Weasley at the Yule Ball. I'm fucking cool, son. Oh, you're going to be on a plane on Valentine's Day, Kayla? 
Oh, that's right. You're going to Japan, aren't you? <laughs> I mean, that's a pretty exciting reason to be on a plane. <laughs> You'd be the slithering doing everyone's homework willingly. No, nah, not willingly. D Dan, you don't understand what it means to be a Slytherin. I need to get paid. I'm not just doing it. I need to get paid. <laughs> like, <coughs> I'll do people's homework. But thing is, number one, you got to pay me. Number two, I'm going to do your homework and you'll pass. But you ain't going to do as good as me. So we're gonna, we're, it's going to be like tiered. Like, I'll do your homework. I'll make sure you pass. When you do someone's homework, you got to... You gotta have, like, a pay tier from, you know, C to A. Well, yeah, exactly. Like, you wanna pass? You wanna, like, be top of the class? You wanna just skate by? You gotta tell me what you want. And if you want that A, you wanna be top marks? Alright, you can get your top marks. But not as top as me. Cause I'm top of the class, son. So you're gonna be just, like, right below me. Cause you can't beat me. I can't let you beat me. You know? I don't know pay me enough i'll let you do nah that. nah you're not gonna beat me i just just you could be right under there but it's still at the end of the day snape's gonna be like ah oh, this potion this is the best in the class you you like a top second but me i'm like yeah this is perfect this is the best draft of living death ever trevor is gonna be in a coma for 20 years if you give this to him because i did my shit lex has gone over to the dark side she has always been on the dark side the green side. Slytherins aren't bad. Why, why are we... Just, we're not bad. We're we're just looking out for our own interests. That's it. Just... At the expense of everyone else. That Why? Everyone's winning Lucius in this situation. Lucius was disappointed that Draco let a muggle-born do better at, in all the classes. This yeah, is was. true. Yes, he was. How dare Hermione. Imagine some good study groups cheating groups in the Slytherin common room. Yeah. I'll, I'll head that. No, I wouldn't get ca Listen, I would not get caught. Come on. Tom is not on my side with this. He doesn't understand how good I am at forging um, other kinds of handwriting. Like, as a, as a muggle? Like, think that's about true. what I could do if I had magic. Oh my that's god. That's true. That's your superpower as an artist. You can forge. I, I'm really good at forging other kinds of handwriting, regardless of the fact that if I had magic, Except I would. You just admitted it. I would be like, to Tom. No, so I'd you be like. You better not forge anything going forward because there's evidence that you can do it now. I'd be like, Tom Riddle. I'd be like, I always knew I was special. Like, eh. And Kayla, I'm sorry you had to cancel it. I get it, though. I'm on the plane coming home from Hawaii. Oh. Kayla! Oh my god! What the Wait. heck? <laughs> You're on the plane coming home from Hawaii on Valentine's Day? Oh my... Well, we might see you. We, uh, Kayla, we might see you. Yeah, where are you going in Hawaii? Yeah, please tell us where you're going to in Hawaii. You don't have to give us specifics, but we're actually taking a vacation there. We're going to be on Oahu. Tom, I wouldn't let a D student get an A if Goyle came up to me and was like, I, I need to get a B in Transfiguration. I'd be like, dude, best I can do for you is a C. If I, get, if I wrote a paper and you got a B, McGonagall would be up my ass and she'd know. No, you, you think I'm that dumb? If, if some D student was like, I need a passing grade, I'm not going to write something that's going to give you an A. I'm going to write something that gets you enough to just scrape by, dude. Like, mm, mm, mm. Like, and even if they wanted an A and they paid me enough, I'd, I'd write something simple enough that to get all the points to potentially get an A, but not with such good language. Come on, man. Come on. Tom, you have no faith in me as a Slytherin. You have no faith that I'm not clever enough to do that. Come on. Tom has no faith. He don't. Tom does not understand and he doesn't know me. Uh, Harry was a bit of a slither in using the Prince book in year six, even in the... Well, I mean, yeah, that's true, Anna. The hat did have trouble with Harry deciding Harry. I mean, Harry was almost a Slytherin. He was almost a Slytherin. And he does have Slytherin qualities. And we also must 
take into consideration the Horcrux part of Harry. That's true. The Horcrux part of Harry, but also the part of Harry that is, like, very ambitious and cunning. There is a part of Harry that is very Slytherin, but he is much more, in and of himself, Gryffindor. Plus the Horcrux part. Yeah. Well, yeah. Dumbledore definitely messed up with that. Wait, what? Getting Snape to teach Harry occlumency. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Dumbledore, what were you thinking? No, it'll be fine. They'll get along. It'll be good. They'll, yeah. they'll overcome their prejudices. No, Dumbledore. Bad idea. Too noble in your thoughts. Going on the 28th from Sydney? Yes, Our... but, but where will you be in Hawaii? Because... Well, she doesn't have to tell us specifically. Okay, fair mm-hmm. enough. We we're... just... We just, like... Can you tell us what island you'll be on? Is that is that not too specific? But, uh, yeah, we're going on the 3rd. Right, so we'll be in Hawaii on the 3rd. February 3rd. <clears throat> Dan. Don't be silly. Oh! We should meet up, Kayla. I'm telling you right now, we should meet up. We be there. I'm not sure if that would insult you or compliment you. If I was to say you would make a perfect Slytherin. That is, I will I take mean, it. It's a compliment. It's highly a compliment. Oh, uh, okay. So we'll just miss each other. Oh, well, that's too bad. Bummer. Can bond over the loss of Lily. I mean, they could if Snape could pull his head out of his ass. Listen. We're n- no, we're not going there about Snape. I'm not talking about that right that's, now. That's... No, we're not going there because I'll talk for an hour and a half about Snape yeah, and it, Lily. It is almost 7.30. So we we're not going there. <laughs> we're not going there. Um, but I will take it as a compliment that I could be potentially the perfect Slytherin. Slughorn would collect me and I would let him collect me. He would try, and I would, that I would let him. Sounds so weird. I would let Slughorn collect me, and I would bring him crystallized pineapple all the time. Every time. Okay. Listen, it's... listen, Slughorn. Slughorn has, um, a vision of life, and how life should be. And I could prescribe to that. I'm just saying. Oh, more crystallized pineapple, Professor. Just okay, saying. this has gone. gone I'm weird. just saying. I'm just saying. You get you, you know. Um, get what you want out of life. Why is that just a Slytherin only thing? Get what you want out of life. Take it. The world is yours, Tony Montana. It's the take it. It's yours. Why is everyone, like, all up in arms about this? You know how Scarface ended, right? Like, you've seen the movie. Well, right? he got high in his own supply. That was his mistake. I wouldn't make the same mistake. I'm just saying. It just, the world is yours. All right. <laughs> Lex knows how I feel about Snape and Dumbledore. <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm saying we're not going to talk about Snape. We're not going to talk about Dumbledore. This is not the stream for that. <laughs> we're almost done streaming. We're not going to... Mm, I was going to say, we do have to wrap it up in a minute, so I just wanted to... Slughorn is my... Quick brainstorm. What chapter do you think we should read next? Because I'm thinking... I mean, feel free to leave any suggestions, but I feel like we need to continue to the next chapter. You we want, built the, up... The hearing? I think we should do the hearing. That's fine. We can the, read the next chapter. We got a lot of foreshadowing in this, but it's. I'm sorry if my reading was not that good tonight, guys. Like I said, I, I was wasn't... pretty impressed with you know you being a little tipsy. Did I do okay yeah. being being not sober? All right, well that's cool. I just I want to apologize for everyone if if it wasn't like the best reading because I was not sober. But if it was good, sweet. Um, I I will be sober next time. I promise. And if we read, uh, the next chapter. I'll make sure I'm sober for that. Because I'm down. Wait, Dan, are you saying that Crouch Jr. is your third favorite teacher? He... Do you place Crouch above Snape? Damn. 
That actually really hurts me, Dan. Damn, that was just, that was just such a smooth insult. That was great. My God, that was the perfect way to burn Snape. I don't know if you meant to do it, but that was nice. I'm hurting in my soul right now, actually. Dan has hurt me very deeply. Wow, that's crazy because we have the entire book six that I read. It's just kind of chilling. Drunk Slughorn is great. Drunk Slughorn is great. And there were other ones. I'm assuming that uh, WB just got to them and took them down at some point. Wow. No, he's not. Snape taught Harry more than anyone else. I challenge anyone on that. Snape taught me, taught me, taught Harry <laughs> more than anyone else in the entire series. I dare you to defy me. Crouch Jr. did teach him a lot. Crouch actually. Jr. did teach them a lot, which is very bizarre given that he was like Voldemort's most like loyal death eater and he's like here kids i'm gonna teach you how to uh fight against all the things my boss loves to do go <laughs> like great teacher but not the not the smartest uh, not the best snape, tactician snape hands down best teacher of the entire series that's Don't. true he did teach the kids better until the attempted murder and it was just harry like, that, that's the only person he treated badly. No, he's talking about Crouch Jr. Oh. No, uh, what Anna said. Oh. But Snape taught more than just vital things. Snape was Harry's best teacher. I defy anyone to prove me wrong. Snape was Harry's best teacher. All right, well, then not just leave. in life lessons, but in spell work, like the entirety of book six, Snape teaches Harry so much without the prejudice of Harry knowing that it's Snape teaching him all these things. He learns so much from Snape via the prince's book, but he just doesn't know it without that prejudice being there. Snape and Harry teach each other so much and snape teaches harry so much he is harry's best teacher which is why it's so crazy because he's so cruel to harry but he is also his best teacher hermione was also a teacher i mean i feel like everyone taught harry something even ron ron was a pretty good teacher i feel like Ron needed a lot taught to him, though, too. <laughs> yeah. He was street smart. Hermione was book smart. Which is why they're such a good couple. Mm -hmm. Because Ron is all street smart. Hermione is all book smart. Like, oh my god. That moment when Lav Lavender Brown is, like, crying about her rabbit dying. And she was like, Professor Trelawney predicted it, blah, blah, blah. And Hermione's like, well, really? I mean, your rabbit died. Didn't How, it die like, like a year later or something? It, it died like a few, like, Professor Trelawney said, the thing you're dreading the most is going to happen in like four weeks time. And then in four weeks, like, she gets the, like, note from her parents that her rabbit died. And Hermione's like, well, I mean, Binky died, but... Ooh, she's like throwing logic at her and like really upsetting Lavender Brown. And Hermione's actually kind of being an asshole, but she doesn't realize she's being an well, asshole. Oh, Lavender Brown. But she's like throwing logic at Lavender Brown when clearly it's a very emotional situation and mm -hmm. the logic is. And Hermione is just like, bah, bah, bah. and Ron is like, Hermione, shut the fuck up. <laughs> this is not the time. Stop. And Hermione's just like, no, but. Blah, 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 blah. If Binky had died, blah, 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 blah. and her Lavender Brown is like getting more upset, and Ron is just like, Hermione, shut up, stop, like, ugh. uh, yeah, you know what? I'll agree right there. Lupin is the best teacher. For no, the short amount of time that he was there, how no. much he taught them, no, and not even just how much he taught them, but like what. Lupin taught Harry, saved Harry's life like three times. 
Okay, but I'm still Minimum. going to say that Snape is Harry's best teacher. Both in life and academically. I feel like this would be a cool debate to have. Who was Harry's best yeah. teacher? Who taught him... Who Maybe taught him? Who taught him Expelliarmus? Who taught him about the Bezor? Like, come on! Who taught him? Well, you know, he never would have learned Expelliarmus without uh, Lockhart being there too. Wow, are you really gonna say Lockhart right now? Come on. That being said, Lupin was a great teacher. Love Slughorn. But as far as being Harry's best teacher, it's Snape. That's the point, is the teacher that know. bullied might... him, the teacher that he hated, the teacher that bullied him. That's the whole point, is the teacher that he refused to learn from, the teacher that he hated the most. At the very end, when you encapsulate the whole series, the teacher that taught him the most was Snape. The most, quantity wise, but quality you could argue Lupin. Like nah, I said, not quality. I mean, come on now. All right, expecto patronum. Lupin taught him expecto patronum. Mm -hmm. That's a big deal. But Snape taught him so much more beyond just spells. All right, we don't have time to get in this. We today. don't. We don't. And on that note, I think we need to end it. We do. I'm. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna just keep going on but, some shit. Thank you so much for the suggestion for the chapter because it was one of those that I definitely wouldn't have thought of off the top of my head. But it wasn't one I would have picked. I there was actually a lot in this chapter. We get to see the, the ministry. and You know, I didn't even get to say what I wanted to say. So Tom agrees with me. Just got to say it. If you get into the fact that Snape is the Half-Blood Prince, then I do have a point. Okay, fair enough. But, uh, okay, I'm just going to say a quick... Because I didn't get to say it before because we got into this whole topic. Uh, so I love how they, how you get further into the ministry. And it goes from this gilded, great hall, palace looking thing. And then it ends with, with the, Harry with the really gross going statue. down. And you end up in this dark corridor with this gross statue. And it just shows like the the facade that the ministry is putting up even though it looks gilded and beautiful and gilded and beautiful it's rotting from the inside yeah that's true you got these like dungeon like corridors where he's going to have his trial yeah once you oh. get deeper in and also the statue is gross we can all agree the statue is gross mm -hmm. Oh, the witch and wizard. Oh, all the beings look adoringly up at it. And it's also foreshadowing for Dumbledore using it later mm -hmm. in the battle. <laughs> and also we get to see some of the, the prejudice going on with, you know, the wizard, the great wizard. And, very handsome, very noble. Yeah. And, and all the other magical creatures look up to them. First of all, I feel like if a centaur saw that shit, like a real centaur saw that shit, he would trample it oh 100 percent. yeah they would not be cool with that but yeah for sure all right all right i just had to get that off no my it's chest. all good um i I'm... thought that was like the chapter as a whole just had this whole great imagery of it does there's this whole like facade thing going yeah. on like the the whole top of it is gilded and wooden floors and everything's very pretty and then when you get down deeper it's like darker and dank and not as glamorous and yeah. and how appropriate once we get into this nasty dark dank corridor is when we first meet <laughs> umbridge dolores jane umbridge who really encapsulates the ministry because she does put on this cute facade she... and she is the most evil maniacal bitch alive ah uh Arguably, some people say more evil than Voldemort himself. <laughs> yeah, I would agree. I um, mean, Voldemort, yeah, he just kills you. Maybe feed your body to a snake. It could happen. But it could. He might torture you. Umbridge will kill might you. Curse she you. Just, I he, mean, maybe I mean, Voldemort could torture you. For That's a only bit. if you have information. Well, I mean, he could Umbridge do some just, shit. Like to you. enjoys torturing. 
She, yeah, Umbridge. <laughs> I actually can't wait to read Umbridge again. It's been so long since I've been able to read some Dolores Umbridge. And honestly, I quite miss it because she's so fun to read. She's like Voldemort. Each passage of her dialogue is so rich and enjoyable. Though she doesn't have the same kind of monologues, but that's fine. All right, Dolores, you want to take us out? <clears throat> Everyone, have a lovely evening, and we shall see you all very soon. And until then, remember, you must not tell lies.